Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to our part two of three of Ilana Kaplan's special program at the Merowith Center. Ilana, uh, thank you for joining us. We understand that you're in Israel. And um, if you'd like to say a few words, please uh, share uh, with us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Laura. And yes, I am. I'm here in Jerusalem. Um, and I'm, I am doing this program on uh, an exhibit at the Met, but I will end with a Dutch masterpiece that's in the Israel Museum, um, just, uh, you know, um, to honor uh, everyone here in Israel. This is an amazing country where even though there's been a lot of um, ho horrible death and, and destruction and loss of life, and it's terrible, but the people of Israel are very strong and uh, everyone here is banding together, volunteering, uh, helping each other. There's so much um, volunteering going on here. I, I, I was telling Laura, I spend my days volunteering, cooking and baking for soldiers and for displaced families. And um, my kids and I are very busy with that, um, visiting um, uh, people in hospitals um, and spending my evenings, you know, trying to get some work done, although it's, it's, it is hard to concentrate um, but what's most amazing here is that really everyone here is is fighting this uh, uh, this terror with goodness and light and helping each other and 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 coming together to fight this horrible uh, terror that's going on. So um, the Israel Museum has, of course, been closed as as many things are. Um, but uh, just we will end with the. Uh, a painting from there to, um, uh, I, I guess, in, in, in memory of all the people who have been killed and in honor of the amazing country that Israel is, a light onto nations. Okay, so with that, well, I'll switch gears. And uh, it's very important, even in these times, to try and have, you know, other things that we do and, and uh, um, have some kind of some kind of schedule and some kind of normalcy in life. And so we'll do, I'll do that today by um, talking about art, which is something that I love to do. Uh, and as I said, we're gonna be looking at this exhibit, which has been, uh, it's a special exhibit at the Met, but it's been up for a while and it will be up for a little while. Uh, it's called In Praise of Painting, Dutch Masterpieces at the Met. And I'll do a little bit of an intro and then we'll start looking at the works of art. Um, so Dutch paintings of the 17th century, which is uh, the golden age of Rembrandt, Halls, and Vermeer, have been a highlight of the Met collection since the museum's founding purchase in 1871. So the Met purchased their first Dutch masterpiece, which was done by a woman artist. We'll look at her soon. Uh, they purchased that first painting in 1871. The, this special exhibit that we're looking at today brings together some of the museum's greatest paintings to present this remarkable chapter of art history in a new light. There's 67 works of art in this exhibit and they're organized thematically uh, and we'll look at a handful of them. Um, and the exhibit orients visitors to key issues in 17th century Dutch culture from debates about religion and conspicuous consumption to painters fascination with the domestic lives of women. The paintings that we will be looking at are from what we call the Dutch golden age of painting, which is a period in Dutch history spanning the 17th century during and after the latter part of the 80 years war, which was from 1568 to 1648. And that was a war for Dutch independence. The new Dutch Republic was the most prosperous nation in Europe at the time and led European trade, science and art. The upheavals and large scale transfers of population of the war and the sharp break of the old monarchist and Catholic cultural traditions meant that Dutch art had to reinvent itself almost entirely in a task in which it was largely successful, as we will see. The painting of religious subjects declined very sharply at this time, but a new large market for all kinds of secular subjects grew up. So the paintings we'll mostly be looking at are paintings with secular subjects, as opposed to the older paintings, which were more religious subjects. A distinctive feature of the period is the proliferation of distinct genre paintings, which we will see. Artists of the Golden Age spent most of their careers painting Hi. portraits, genre scenes, landscapes, seascapes, and... You know what, hang on, hang on one second. Okay, 
Um, so uh, artists of the golden age spent most of their careers painting portraits, genre scenes, landscapes, seascapes, or still lifes. And we'll see examples of all these. Um, and many of these types of subjects were new in Western paintings at the time. And the way the Dutch artists painted them in this period was very decisive for their future development. So one of the questions that I want everyone to think about as we're looking at these paintings is why these Dutch paintings are among the most beloved in the Met's collection. Why do they remain so meaningful and compelling to modern viewers? Most of these paintings are from the mid 1600s and yet they're still so compelling to us today. We all have our own answers to these questions. Uh, I'll suggest a few, but I want everyone also to think about it during, you know, during my talk. So maybe they're still very compelling uh, many years later because the paintings are suffused with emotion, maybe because many of them are scenes of everyday life, which we can all relate to. Perhaps they show a tranquility of life that many of us yearn for. Uh, I'm especially connecting to that right now during this uh, um, very uh, overwhelming time period. These paintings show a tranquility of life, which is, is really nice. Um, so as we're looking at the paintings, think about your own answers to these questions, and maybe at the end we can share some of our answers as to why these paintings are really still so popular um, and so compelling to modern viewers. Okay, so with that, we're going to get started with our paintings. The first artist that we're going to look at today, his name is uh, Gerard Tubork, and I will uh, start, as I said, with my talk on Van Gogh, that I have, you know, my American accent, so I don't say all the Dutch names exactly the way they should be said. Um, uh, but the artist who did this, his name is Gerard Tubork the Younger. Um, he was a Dutch genre artist who lived in the Dutch Golden Age, 1617 to 1681, and he was the most accomplished member of a gifted and well-to-do artistic family. He was so highly esteemed that King Philip IX sat for the artist when he was in Spain. Most of Terborg's genre scenes focus on the more refined elements of Dutch society, as we see and as we will see in his paintings. His works are generally small and upright in format, and typically they depict two or three elegantly clad, full-length figures engaged in an activity such as letter writing or music making, um, really, as we talked about, these genre scenes. Uh, his paintings are executed with great sensitivity of touch and show an interest in the psychology of the sitters. Terborg also painted many small-scale full-length portraits. He influenced fellow Dutch artists, including Vermeer, who we will also be looking at today. So our first painting here, it's called A Young Woman at Her Toilet with a Maid. Uh, it's from around 1650 to 1651, and it's, uh, the medium is oil on wood, and the size of it is 18 and 3 fourths inches by 13 and 5 eighth inches. And I will tell you the size of them again because they all look pretty much the same size, but this is actually a, a very small painting. Um, just a word about, because a few of these paint, Dutch paintings, as we know, were painted on uh, oil paintings on wood. Uh, and just a little background on that, many Dutch artists continued to use wood panels sometime after the rest of Western Europe had really abandoned using um, wooden panels. Unfortunately, there are very few surviving Golden Age paintings uh, that were painted on wood because what would sometimes happen is that um, artists would overpaint on paintings. They would make new paintings over uh, the old paintings throughout the 18th and 19th century because they found it cheaper to paint over a wooden uh, painting that had done, been done on, wo on wood than to buy new canvas and stretcher and frame. So unfortunately we have lost a lot of those uh, uh, oiled paintings that were done on wood during the Dutch golden age. But we do have a couple of them and I will point them out and this is one of them. So here we have uh, this painting by Gerard Terborg and it shows a well-off young woman adjusting the ribbons of her bodice in front of a dressing table. And you can see behind her an adolescent maid waiting with a uh, basin, a linen towel, and a pitcher of water. We can really see the artist's uh, trademark skill here in the gleam of the polished silver and the metallic thread, the iridescent pink satin, and the uh, velvet of the upholstered chair. And you'll notice with the three or four paintings that we see of Gerard Terborg that he really focuses on fabrics and materials in, in such an amazing way. Um, the model for this central figure that we see here was the artist's younger sister, Jezina, who herself was an artist and a poet, and she appears in many of her brother's paintings. Our next painting is called The Van Morkerken Family, also done by Gerard Terborg, the younger. This is also oil on wood. Uh, it was painted around 1653 to 54, 
and the size is 16 and a fourth inches by 14 inches. So another smaller painting. Um, this is a portrait of the artist's cousin. This man here is actually the artist's cousin. His name is Hartong van Morkeken and his wife, Sibylla, and their son. So in this painting, the artist, Terborg, actually broke with convention by depicting the wife on the left side. Uh, the left side was traditionally the superior and male side of the painting. Uh, you'll notice that the composition is asymmetrical, kind of lopsided and dynamic. Uh, we see the young husband's gesture. He's showing a pocket watch to his wife. And this gives the painting an element of storytelling. You know, why is he showing the pocket watch to his wife? Um, what is this special pocket watch that he's showing? So there's some kind of storytelling going on here. This emotionally convincing depiction of a nuclear family signals a break with the dynastic imagery of previous generations. Although an older tradition persists in the three coats of arm that are cut, clustered up here in the upper left-hand corner. So this painting shows a recognizably affectionate family, which you, yet, you actually don't always see in 17th century paintings, uh, really an affectionate family. And how do we see the affection? We see the young mother is holding uh, her child's hand. The father, as I said, is trying to draw his wife's attention to the expensive pocket watch that he has. But at the same time, we have this coat of arms uh, in the upper left-hand corner, which is a more ancient or archaic way of representing individuals. Um, we can see that they're wearing fashionable black clothing, which is a holdover from Spanish rule. Uh, Tabarok uses the pocket watch to announce social status, but at the same time, the watch is actually a reminder of mortality. And these two ideas are embodied in the firstborn son, who is truly the star of this painting. We can see that clearly the spotlight is on this chubby-cheeked young boy. Uh, as, and I said, as I said, Terborg positions his wife on the left side, which is a position of honor, and that acknowledges her elevated status as a mother of a surviving male heir. You can imagine in the 1650s, having a surviving male heir uh, did not happen often, um, so this really elevated her, her status uh, in this painting. Um, according to traditional hierarchies, of course, women were always depicted on the right side of the painting um, when they were shown with their husbands, but here she's shown on the left side, giving her a lot of honor. And uh, Terborg has really upended the traditional hierarchies by arranging the painting this way. This is a very tender image, and it's all the more poignant knowing that the father, who was the artist's cousin, outlived both his wife and his son. Okay, our next painting is again, uh, almost a storytelling painting with lots of questions of what's going on here. So I'm gonna describe it a little uh, as you look at it and maybe try and figure out what's going on here. So the name of the painting is called Curiosity, again, by the artist Gerard Terborg the Younger. This one's an oil on canvas, as opposed to the two other ones, which were oil on uh, wood. And this is also a much larger painting. It's 30 inches by 24 and a fourth inches. So here we see three women of different ages and they appear in a luxuriously appointed interior. The oldest woman in the painting has her hair modestly covered and she is writing a letter while the youngest woman in the painting is peering over her shoulder. The third woman uh, is dressed in radiant satin, often associated with Terborg, who loved to uh, show his skill in painting fabrics. And this woman really appears pensive or lovelorn. Um, Dutch women at this time period had a very high rate of literacy compared to their peers in other European countries. And letter writing shows us that they were uh, highly literate. It was also a common feature of courtship. Perhaps this older woman at the table is helping her friend craft a response to a suitor. Again, we don't know what's going on, but it's fun to try and figure out what's going on, what's the story going on in this painting. Uh, the painting, this painting is actually highly unusual for this time period because it came with a trove of primary source documentation. The artist, uh, Gerard Terborg, his half-sister, Hazina, who often uh, modeled for his paintings, actually wrote a lot about this painting um, in her diaries. Uh, she talked about the, the clothing and she talked about some of the furniture and she even talked about the dog that we see on the cushion. The dog's name is Actian and Actian is actually a figure from Greek mythology. Uh, he's notorious for spying on a bathing goddess, Diana. Uh, and the Met actually is a painting uh, called Actian Diana. Um, and the artist's sister, a uh, half sister, Hazina herself was a poet and an artist and also modeled a lot for his paintings. Um, Terborg uh, actually was able to observe the social life of his uh, very precocious and talented teenage half-sister, Hazina, and he inspired a lot of paintings. Uh, he got inspiration for many paintings 
based on her uh, her social life. Um, and so he made a lot of paintings, as we have seen, of women writing letters, making music, which we'll see on the next painting, engaging in flirtation. And they're almost always dressed in this gorgeous satin that Chabork was able to paint better than anyone else has in the history of art. So really take notice of the satin and the materials uh, of, in the clothing in his paintings. Uh, the luscious fabrics of the skirts that we can see here, uh, the gilded fireplace that we see on the side, the plush upholstery um, and the high ceilings, all of these convey an environment of wealth and privilege. The scene is also charged with something else, the feeling of being off limits. Trebork's paintings really tantalize us by showing the behavior of wealthy women when they believe themselves to be unobserved. So they're kind of doing their own thing and they're, they, they believe that they're unobserved in this painting. This is definitely a scene with erotic overtones. One theory is that the beautiful woman standing on the left that we see here has received a love letter and she's asked her more matronly friend to write a response. There's definitely a story going on in this painting. Words are being exchanged that we don't have access to and it makes it all the more tantalizing to us. Trebork's interest in letter writing alludes to another Dutch achievement, of course, which is increased literacy, especially among women, well beyond that of their European contemporaries. Trebork uses letter writing and reading as a way to gesture to the interior life that was something that uh, Trebork actually passed on to his acquaintance, Vermeer. We're going to look at one more Trebork uh, painting before we go on. This is called A Woman Playing the Lute uh, and a Cavalier. It was painted in 1658. Um, this is another oil on wood, and the size of it is 14 and a half by 12 and 3 fourths inches. So interesting, the, the wood paintings are much smaller. Uh, his wood paintings are much smaller than his oil on canvas painting. Um, in this intimate scene, a young woman strums a lute while playing a duet with her suitor. Um, song books, such as the one lying on the table here, were common lover's gifts at the time. The watch that's lying alongside it may symbolize temper, uh, temperaments or perhaps the fleetingness of this affair. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to another artist and another painting, which we're gonna spend a little bit of time on. It's a very fascinating painting. It might just, it looks like a still life, but there's a lot of interesting uh, material here in terms of the artist and in terms of the materials in this painting. The painting is called The Vase of Flowers. It was painted in 1716 by a female artist, as I had mentioned uh, in my introduction. Her name is Margareta Haverman. Uh, this is an oil on wood painting. Um, so we're very happy and lucky that this survived. As I said, many oil on wood paintings did not. And this is a large oil on wood painting. It's 31 and a fourth inches by 23 and three fourths inches. So much larger than those uh, uh, Trebork uh, oil on, on wood paintings that we are looking at. So um, because at this time period, very few women artists had access to nude models, a non number of them became still life specialists. And that's what uh, this artist, Margareta Haverman, she became a still life specialist. She studied with the notoriously secretive flower painter, uh, uh, Jan van Hoysen, and later gained admission to the Royal Academy in Paris, from which we, she was soon expelled for unknown reasons. The artist's skill is on full display in this magnificent arrangement of flowers, fruit and crawling insects set inside a stone niche in which she used innovative pigments such as Prussian blue um, and other colors which we will talk about. Now over time the organic yellow lake pigment has faded resulting in the present blue appearance of the leaves. So if you look carefully at this painting you'll notice that most of the leaves appear to be blue and that's because uh, the blue was created using uh, mixing together, I'm sorry, the green was created uh, mixing together yellow and blue, but because the organic yellow lake pigment has faded, most of the leaves uh, just have the blue left and they, so they appear blue instead of green. Um, the paint, this painting um, is a rare example of Haverman's work as only two paintings by this artist are firmly attributed to her today. So the only two meanings that we know that she made uh, and the Met owns one of them. And this was a painting I referred to at the beginning that was acquired in 1871 by the Met. It's the first Dutch painting in the Met's collection um, and it's the sole painting in the collection by an early modern Dutch woman. As I said, this is one of only two known paintings by Margareta Haverman. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful flower paintings ever created by a Dutch artist. Uh, now, as you're looking at this bouquet, you might, anyone who is uh, familiar with flowers or um, might notice that this painting 
uh, or this bouquet, actually, I should say, could never ha have existed in real life. Because in this painting, you have roses and tulips, hollyhocks, irises, marigolds, and poppies, but they're not all in bloom at the same time. Uh, and you can see that they're all fully in bloom here. Um, and actually, the museum has created a, um, uh, a code for us to tell to show us exactly which flowers are in this painting. So again, those of you, I'm not as much of a, a flower person, but those of you who are into horticulture will um, know many of these flowers and you'll know that they um, certainly cannot all be in bloom at the same time. And yet they're all shown together in this painting. They're all here facing out as if ready for their close up. It looks almost too perfectly arranged. Some flowers heads are very heavy and the stem can't really support them, but they're not drooping. Um, now, as I said before, to invent the most compelling arrangement, Haverman also manipulated certain uh, pigments of color. So uh, in the 17th century, when uh, Haverman was uh, working, a stable, vibrant green pigment did not exist. And that's why artists had to mix blue and green to create, uh, I'm sorry, blue and yellow to create green. So you can see evidence of this in the very large poppy leaf here at the bottom left corner of the painting. And I actually wanna show you a close up of this so we can really see it clearly. So here on the right, we have our painting and here on the left, we have a close up of uh, this very large poppy leaf um, in the painting. So you'll notice that most of the leaf is blue, but you have a little bit of more of the green color over here. So one of the yellows that Haverman used in, uh, in creating the greens in her painting was an organic pigment, which produces a yellow translucent color. But the problem is that that yellow color fades very quickly when it's exposed to light. Now, of course, at the time period when the artists were making these paintings, they didn't know that exposing them to light would fade the pigments. Um, but you know we know that now. So over years of these paintings being exposed to light, many of the pigments have faded. And that's what happened in this painting. A lot of the yellows fade. And what happened when the yellows faded? The greens, you know, you can see some of the green here, the greens turned to blue. And that's, by the way, if you, why you see so much blue in Dutch 17th century flower paintings, because the yellow pigment has faded. Um, now, other pigments uh, surprised the conservators that worked on this painting for the exhibit. There were certain pigments like Prussian blue and Naples yellow, uh, which were very uh, new, innovative colors. And the fact that they were in these paintings indicate that Haverman was a very innovative artist in terms of the pigments that she used. Um, now the Naples yellow was only used in little touches like in this peach over here. Uh, again, this is a close up as you can see of this part of the painting. So here's the peach in the painting. Here's a close up of the peach. And there are little touches of this Naples yellow that she used. And so it seems as if she was almost experimenting with this color, trying it out for the first time. And she was really an innovator with these new materials. It shows that she wasn't just following her teacher or copying his work, but she was really doing her best to create a composition on her own terms. Um, so after this painting was chosen to be in the In Praise of Dutch Painting exhibit, it was brought to the Department of Paintings Conservation at the Met for examination and treatment. So uh, I wanna show you uh, a picture of what it looked like when they were uh, uh, doing this conservation treatment. So before beginning any conservation treatment, conservators and scientists will study a work of art closely under high mag magnification and different lighting condition and employing various imaging and analytical techniques. And this helps them to determine the materials and techniques that artists use in the work's construction and how those materials might've changed or become damaged over time. And that's what we can see right here. Here we are looking at um, uh, an X-ray fluorescent image of the painting on the left. Here's our original painting on the right and an X-ray flu uh, fluorescent image on the left. And this provides us insight into the artist's interests and pre preoccupations. So um, the, the conservators learned that Margaret actually covered up certain flowers and changed and moved certain details, which we can see here. So we see that in this painting, she used uh, vermilion, which is a mercury based orange red pigment uh, to create these uh, red orange flowers in the painting. So uh, now it looks like in the original painting that she actually put some of these red orange flowers up here in the top right of the painting. But we see in the final composition that she ended up covering up these flowers with a dark gray background uh, and an unopened poppy bud. So she, we do know that the artist changed things around. 
Um, some, a lot of the red flowers you do see right here, uh, you can see how they correspond, but these three in the corner here, she ended up covering up. So we see here that artists did change the paintings. They uh, painted on top of or added things or chipped things away. And we'll talk about that with the Vermeer painting later also. So this really shows us how diligently Havermind worked to create a very effective uh, compositional arrangement in this painting. Okay, moving on to our next artist is Jacob Van Roysdel. Um, he did this painting called Wheat Fields in around 1670, and it's an oil on canvas, and it's a larger painting that we've seen. It's the largest one we've seen yet today. It's 39 and 3 eighths inches by 51 and a fourth inches. Um, by the way, uh, I always, when I'm doing programs for, um, for St. Louis audiences, I always like to see what you have at the St. Louis Art Museum. And you actually have two Van Roysdale uh, paintings, uh, a painting, I think, and a, and a drawing. Uh, I don't think either one of them is up right now, but you do have two of this artist, Jacob Van Roysdale's works of art in, in your collection. Um, overall, 27 views of fields by Roysdale survive today. Um, in this celebrated example, the artist used the building blocks of land, sky, and sea, which is all the way back here in the distance, to create an imposing vision of cultivated nature. On the road before us, a man with a traveler's pack approaches a woman and a child that you can see very small here in the distance, while the cumulus clouds dominating the sky add their own element of drama to this painting. A glimpse of boats at the sea on the far left knits this quintessentially Dutch landscape into the wider world. Jacob Van Roysdel is to the Dutch landscape what Vermeer is to the Dutch interior. And we'll see that soon with some of Vermeer's paintings. Jacob Van Roysdel was one of the most famous landscape painters of 17th century Holland and the foremost exponent of the classical phase of Dutch, Dutch landscape painting. He was able to create a poetic and sometimes brooding or tragic mood in his landscapes. Using drawings made on site, he then returned to his studio to compose pictures that evoke the Dutch landscape in a way that no other strictly topographical painting could. One thing that is distinctive of Amsterdam during this prosperous period of the 1660s and 70s is the majesty of this design, the way the clouds rise up dramatically in this painting. We also see a country road which suddenly funnels in from the foreground with the wide angles that come from the corners and quickly taper off into the distance. There are wheat fields on either side of the road and a farm off in the distance. The clouds seem to contain rain within them, within the dark underlinings. The, uh, Van Roysdel conveys the ordinariness of the Dutch landscape, and at the same time, he transfigures it through light, through the depiction of the sky into something dramatic and extraordinary. The gap in the clouds illuminates the woman and her child. We can see her right here, it's very small, but in the middle of the road. The clouds appear to be moving towards us. The painting leads to speculation, like some of our other paintings that we've talked about today. The man here on the road is, is uh, the man you can see here is carrying a bag and moving in the direction of the woman and child, but they are standing still. Are they waiting for him? Is he a father, a brother, or a husband? Has he come off one of these ships that we see in the distance? What's the story going on here? The figures weren't just put into this painting for scale. There's a narrative going on here. Again, something that we can think about and something that we can imagine, the story that's going on here. On the far left, the landscape opens to the sea. Perhaps the artists included the glimpse of the sea as a way to expand the horizon, both literally and figuratively, to show an interconnectedness between this humble bat, between this humble path and some world outside this frame, the big wide world outside the frame. It also shows the importance of Amsterdam as a port city at this time period. What I love about this painting is that when you stand before this landscape, you can almost imagine this landscape coming to life. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next artist and we're gonna see um, three paintings by our next artist. His name is uh, Nicolai Moss and he's actually one of my favorite uh, Dutch um, artists. And you should know that the St. Louis Art Museum does have a painting by this artist. And if we have time at the end, I will show you a, 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 an image of that. The name of this painting is Young Woman Peeling Apples. Uh, and it's from uh, uh, around 1655. 
Um, and it's an oil on wood and the dimensions are 21 and a half by 18 inches. Just a little bit about the artist, Nicholas Moss. He was, uh, his years are 1634 to 1693. He was a Dutch painter known for genre scenes, which we'll be looking at portraits, religious compositions and the occasional still life. In his early years, he was a pupil of Rembrandt in Amsterdam. Let's spend a few minutes looking at this painting. Notice the bright red tones which unify this paintings, linking the maid's costume, the apples that she's peeling, and the Turkish carpet on the table, which all have the color red. This painting was painted a few years after Moss left Rembrandt's studio, and it reveals the artist's debt to his teacher in the soft contours and the effects of light. Previous painters had made housemaids the subject of comic or sexually suggestive scenes, which we actually will see later on. But here in this painting, Moss is very sensitive, a uh, very sensitive and ennobling depiction of a housemaid, and he it's really an important innovation. So notice how the light shines on an image of virtue, a young woman who's performing a humble task. Moss follows his teacher, Rembrandt, who made frequent sketches of the women in his household performing ordinary tasks. These artists are painting real life, people going about their business. Nothing is perfect. If you notice, there's actually dirt on the floor of this painting. The artists have an amazing eye for domestic detail. Notice the source of light. The shadow that the girl has thrown onto the wall, which is quite low down, and the shadow that the candle holder on the wall is throwing, they give you the angle of the window. All the light is coming from a small window quite high up to the viewer's left and to her right. And that would imply that she's sitting in a basement or low down in the house, possibly in a kitchen or in a cellar. This painting is as much a portrait of light as it is a portrait of the young girl. Like his peer Vermeer and his one-time teacher Rembrandt, Moss manipulated the light for its desired effect. The way he painted the light around the objects makes the painting come to light and makes it look completely real. And again, we're you know, keeping in mind why all these paintings are uh, still so compelling today. And again, we're looking at a very um, simple, a very um, uh, uh, every a painting of everyday life here. And maybe that's why it's it's it, it's remained so compelling. Our next painting by Nicholas Mass is called The uh, Lace Maker. It was painted circa 1656. It's an oil on canvas and the size is 17 and 3 fourths inches by 20 and 3 fourths inches. This one was painted slightly after the last painting. And this scene reveals Moss's increased interest in anecdotal domestic detail as he moved further out of Rembrandt's shadow. Here he shows a young mother absorbed in the meticulous work of lace making. That's what she's doing over here. She's making lace while her baby looks boldly out at the viewer from his high chair. As in many of Moss's other works, including the last one that we were just looking at, uh, the woman peeling apple, the color red here is also quite prominent. Notice where you see the red on the baby's hat, on the mother's bodice, and on the tablecloth. And this provides a unifying element. And in the last painting also, the color red really provides a unifying element. I love this painting. It's really, again, a genre painting, a domestic scene, seeing how uh, women made lace uh, in the mid 1600s. You can even see the small pair of scissors hanging down here on the string. The window is open as it often in is, is in many of these paintings. You can see houses out through the a house, out through the window. Look at the, the little boy in this old fashioned uh, high chair and look how it looks like he's thrown some, maybe thrown things on the floor or things were placed on the floor, a cup, a rattle, a bowl. So it's really an everyday scene. And the artist has even printed his name uh, on the bottom of the wooden um, high chair. So again, a scene of everyday life, uh, domestic tranquility. Our last painting by this artist, Nicholas Moss, is a religious one, which I had said he also did religious paintings besides uh, um, genre paintings. Um, and this is called Abraham Dismissing uh, Hagar and Ishmael. It was painted in 1653. It's an oil on canvas and the size is 34 and a half inches by 27 and a half inches. Um, this is actually earlier than the other two paintings we looked at. And uh, it's one of the earliest dated works by Moss, who was uh, the most versatile of Rembrandt's students. From his teacher, Moss had acquired a knack for turning Old Testament stories into powerful domestic narratives. So here he took an Old Testament story, 
uh, about Abraham uh, dismissing Hagar and, and Ishmael. And he turned it into a powerful domestic narrative because as we saw from our last two paintings, he was very interested in domestic scenes. So here in this painting, we have this scene that uh, a subject that Rembrandt also depicted. Rembrandt depicted the same subject matter. And here Moss portrays uh, the Hebrew patriarch Abraham banishing the handmaiden uh, Hagar along with their son Ishmael. Abraham attempts to reassure Hagar, but her downcast gaze um, rhyming with the boys, they're both looking downcast, uh, downcast conveys her abandonment and her dissolution. Now we're gonna move on to two artists and we're gonna move on to some uh, humorous paintings and talk about those. This painting is done by Franz Hals, uh, a Dutch artist. Uh, it was painted in 1623, it's an oil on canvas and the dimensions are 41 and a half inches by 31 and a fourth inches. Uh, by the way, the St. Louis Art Museum also has a painting by this artist Franz Hals in its collection. This painting was painted with a characteristic, characteristically bold brushwork that Howells had learned from Flemish painting, and it provides a gleefully non-judgmental depiction of a young couple uh, cruising in the doorway of either an inn or a brothel. You can see that they have flushed cheeks and open mouth grins, which indicate that the pair has broken with contemporary rules of comportment. Yet even the humble interior which they find themselves in boasts a landscape painting above a mantelpiece here in the background. And again, this interior space we think is either an inn back here or perhaps a brothel. So the young man over here is raising a glass and the young woman is clinging to his side. Um, as I said, they're in a tavern or brothel, probably they aren't legally wed, but perhaps we are meant to look at the image from a vantage point of moral superiority. This was a time of great prosperity and indulgence in the Dutch Republic, but a stern Calvinist influence still pervaded society. Paintings like this one may have been warnings against excess. This painting would have been a very expensive luxury product made for someone in the upper echelons of society. And for that reason, people have assumed that we are supposed to adopt a scornful, condescending vantage point of, of these people. Um, but... On the other hand, why would people want to buy an expensive, beautifully painted image of people for whom they had contempt? Art historians like to debate this type of painting. Is it a painting that's supposed to amuse and give pleasure? Or is there a critically moral message at the heart of this painting? Again, a lot of these paintings have questions and interesting things to think about that you can think, of, you know, think about long beyond uh, our discussion today. So another one of these paintings that perhaps has a critically moral message at the heart of it is our next painting. Uh, I, I really like this painting, it's a lot of fun. The name of the painting is The Dissolute Household. The artist is Jan Steen, he's a Dutch artist. It was painted around 1663 to 64. By the way, as you notice, almost all these paintings have a circa date. We don't know exactly, but around that time. It's an oil on canvas and it's quite large. It's 42 and a half inches by 35 and a half inches. There's a lot going on here, so I'm gonna kind of talk through and describe what's going on in this painting. So as I said, this painting also contains some lessons on morality. Uh, the artist, uh, Jan Steen, uh, I'm sorry, Jan Steen often made himself the butt of his own jokes. Here he placed uh, himself in the painting. This is a self-portrait of the artist right here in the middle of the painting. And he's at the center of this domestic chaos. Here we can see the artist entwines his fingers with those of the housemaid. And the housemaid is pouring a generous serving of wine to his wife. We can see in this painting broken glass, a mischievous cat, and romping young boys. They all contribute to the general impression of a household run amok. Suggestions of an ominous fate hang literally over the family's heads in the form of this basket up here that you can see. In the, ba in the basket, it's a little hard to see, but in the basket is actually uh, a beggar's crutch and a uh, can, as well as clappers. Clappers at that time were used to warn of leprosy or they were used to warn of the plague. Um, and we also have in this, in this basket, a jack of spades, uh, which is signifying misfortune. So the painting, the painting uh, depicts a bunch of discretions, sloth, lust, gluttony, sacrilege, gambling, vanity, and poor parenting. Whether it's over overindulgence in food, alcohol, and tobacco, whether it's the husband's flirtation with the housemaid, 
or the way the children are running wild in this painting, even we have an unsupervised cat in the painting, all suggests that the patriarch of the family is not doing his job by not imposing an atmosphere of discipline, which was expected at that time period. As we said, the artist is seated in the middle of it all and his sly smirk, look at his face, very sly smirk suggests that he is in on the joke. On the right, uh, we think that this is probably Jan Stein's wife and that she was a model for this reclining woman reaching for another drink. On the left, these, we think that the children in the painting were actually his own sons that he used as models for the unruly boys who are actually tormenting the sleeping woman over here. They're trying to wake her up. Throughout this rack is seen are smaller still life arrangements the table you might see has a blue and white porcelain bowl that's filled with fruit. We also have a peeled lemon on the table. We have half of a peach on the table. And we also have tobacco, which was a relatively recent import from the New World. And uh, tobacco was frowned upon by Calvinist preachers. Uh, and as I said before, overhead is a more grave warning. The still life in the basket hangs over the family and contains uh, plague rattles and clappers that are Leper would use to announce his or her presence, sticks that may be used to deliver a beating, all sorts of intimations of the dire fate that can await people who engage in this sort of excess that we see in the painting. Most of all, we are witness to what might be the most supreme sin in the Dutch culture, a disorderly household. And that's why the name of the painting is uh, The Dissolute Household. And um, so here we saw two kind of fun paintings that you do see uh, uh, in, in Dutch paintings. And again, the question is if these are kind of moralizing painting with a critically moral message or are they supposed to amuse? Okay, moving on to our next artist is uh, Peter de, de Hoek. So we, uh, it's, I've heard it's, his name sa said different ways. The Dutch say it uh, de Hoek, uh, some say de Hoek. Um, so we're going we're gonna to say De Hooch today, Peter De Hooch. And here we have a painting called Interior with a Young Couple. That's the name of the painting. It's oil on canvas, uh, was ma made circa 1662 to 65. And the dimensions are 21 and 5 eighths inches by 24 and 3 fourths inches. So Peter De Hooch was a Dutch golden age painter, famous for his genre works of quiet domestic scenes with an open doorway. We've seen some paintings with open doorways, open windows. Um, he was a contemporary of Vermeer um, with whom his work shares themes and styles. And the artist uh, uh, De Hoot was particularly skilled at interior scenes that capture the fall of light into rooms constructed from elaborately interlocking rectangular forms. Notice all the rectangles in this painting. There are a lot of them. These spaces provide the backdrop for a glimpse into the private lives of prosperous families. Here we see a young couple sharing an intimate moment in their bedroom. The woman gazes into a mirror on the wall while the man plays with their dog. Again, notice things that we'll talk about more with Vermeer and Rembrandt paintings, but notice the light coming in from the windows, the effect of the light, the open windows, the open doors. And in the, this painting particularly are also the uh, geometric shapes. Our next painter by the same uh, artist, uh, uh, Pieter de Hooch, is called The Visit, circa 1657. It's an oil on wood, um, and it's 26 and 3 fourths inches by 23 inches. And the artist situated this scene in what's called a voorhuis, which is the street-facing room in a narrow Dutch row house that received the best light. Again, light's very important in these paintings. The placement of the window, here we have the window, and the construction of the space reveal the close dialogue that de Hooch had with Vermeer at the time. And we'll see that in our, uh, we're gonna look at Vermeer paintings next. But elements such as the plate of aphrodisiac oysters on the table and this canopy bed over here suggest that de Hooch most likely intended this particular scene to represent a brothel rather than a respectable home. Uh, one more painting by the artist, Pierre de Hooch, is Leisure Scene, Leisure, I'm sorry, Leisure Time in an elegant setting. Um, it was painted circa 1663 to 65. It's an oil on canvas and it's 22 inches by 27 and 5 16 inches. So here the artist depicts a family in, in a luxurious interior with gilt leather wallpaper that you can see on the walls, Chinese porcelain, 
uh, and a suggestive painting up here of naked lovers above the cabinet. But the family's ease and prosperity exist in tension with another scene glimpsed through the open door on the far right. So we can see there's an open door over here. And if you can see in the open door, there's a young man and he's confronting a bearded figure on the threshold. Perhaps it is a wayfarer seeking elms. Okay, and now we're going to get to our last two artists, which are probably our most well-known artists, but I didn't want to start with them because I, uh, I didn't want to take away from the other very well-known and important Dutch artists that we looked at first. So we're going to look at a few paintings by Vermeer and then a few paintings by um, Rembrandt. So the painting that we're looking here is called Young Woman with a Water Pitcher, uh, circa 1662, done by uh, Johannes Vermeer. Uh, it's an oil on canvas and the dimensions are 18 inches by 16 inches. So here we see uh, a woman standing at an open window. Again, we've seen a lot of open windows today. Um, and she's beginning her day with washing from a gilt silver uh, pitcher and basin with linen coverings protecting her, her dress and her hair. Look at the crisp white fabric that covers the woman's head and shoulders and the careful description of the way light enters the room from the diffuse illumination of the wall to the gleaming highlights on the picture and on the basin. Vermeer is able to capture every nuance of light's effect. But, uh, this is actually the first work of Vermeer to enter any American collection and the painting embodies the artist's interest in domestic themes as we've seen a lot today giving an almost voyeuristic glimpse into the private life of a woman before she presents her public face to the world. The composition is exquisitely structured with every element in perfect balance. The image seems entirely self-contained and yet it points to places far from Holland. Notice the map on the wall, which suggests the wider world and also the carpet on the table is a Turkish import. Uh, there, there are signs of wealth in this painting, the gold plated pitcher, the jewelry box with the strand of pearls, the Persian carpet on the table. Vermeer also captures the quietness of the moment. He's an expert at painting domestic settings. The shapes in the painting are also very interesting to observe. Notice the triangle or cone of the shape of the woman in the middle of the painting. Uh, and it's the, in the middle of three rectangles. We have the rectangle of the window, the rectangle of the table, and the rectangle of the map that's on the wall. So there's really balanced geometry to the painting. The colors are mostly restricted to the primaries, red, blue, and yellow. So in terms of design, color, and light, there's a sense of balance, a sense of tranquility, which really suits the subject, which is a peace, tranquility, and well-being of a domestic scene during the decade that was the most prosperous in the Netherlands in its history. Vermeer, as we know, is famously interested in light. Look at her forearm, the woman's forearm, with the flare of light coming from behind it. Vermeer probably worked on this composition on and off for three months, adjusting the composition and deleting motifs. As I said before, some of these artists would add or delete uh, motifs from the painting. Vermeer captured an everyday moment and yet the painting is immediate and timeless. He painted almost all of his paintings in the exact same spot in his house. He was fascinated by the particular fall of light within this one room in his home. Vermeer was actually not a well-known artist during his lifetime. He's very famous today, but he was not well known in his lifetime. He only came to prominence in the late 19th century. And this was one of the first, uh, this is actually the first of his works of art to enter an American collection. Um, there are 36 paintings by Vermeer that are known to exist and the Met owns five of them. Vermeer is best known for his quiet interiors populated by women. He captures a quiet stillness that is often missing in contemporary life. His paintings show humble, recognizable human tasks that people can relate to. You don't need to think deeply or analyze symbolism when looking at a Vermeer painting. We may no longer use the light from a window to bathe with a pitcher and basin, but this quiet, solitary moment remains eminently relatable today. And again, perhaps that's a reason that we like these and relate to these paintings so much because uh, it's an everyday scene, um, recognizable human tasks, uh, everyday, everyday life. Okay, our next Vermeer painting is called A Maid Asleep. Um, and as I said, the Met owns five Vermeer paintings. We'll be looking at four of them today. So this is the second one, A Maid Asleep. Uh, it was painted circa 1656 to 57. It's oil on canvas 
and the dimensions are 34 and a half inches by 30 and an eighth inch. So the misbehavior of unsupervised maidservants was a common subject for 17th century Dutch painters, uh, as we saw in uh, two of our earlier um, uh, humorous paintings. Yet in this depiction, we have a young maid dozing, uh, dozing off over here, taking a little nap. And Vermeer has transfigured an ordinary scene into an investigation of light, color, and texture that supersedes any moralizing lesson. Um, we can see that the tablecloth is a little bit rumpled. Um, and it, there's an indication in this painting that there must have been someone else. There must have been a visitor that this maid had, right? Because there's a, another chair that's kind of pushed out from the table. The door is slightly open. There must have been a recently departed visitor. Also, X radiographs indicate that Vermeer chose to remove a male figure that was originally standing in the doorway. Um, so again, that um, that picture I had shown you at the beginning, the painting of the flowers and the X radiograph image I showed you, the conservators did this and uh, did that on this painting also, and they saw that there was actually a male figure originally in this painting. Again, all these elements heighten the ambiguity of this painting. Why is she sleeping? Who was visiting her? Why is the tablecloth a little bit rumpled over here? Um, uh, lots of questions. And again, also the light that's coming in through the door, um, indicative of Vermeer's interest in light in his paintings. Okay, our next painting is a very famous one, Study of a Young Woman, circa 1665 to 67. It's an oil on canvas, and it's a small painting, 17 and a half by 15 and three fourths inches. So in this painting, we see that soft light illuminates the face of a young woman who is dressed in exotic clothing and costume jewelry. Now, this painting is very similar to Vermeer's other famous painting, Girl with a Pearl Earring. And I'll show you that one also. So this is the Metz painting, Study of a Young Woman. This is Girl with a Pearl Earring, which is in The Hague. Um, and these paintings were probably not commissioned portraits, but pr probably both of these paintings are so-called tronies, which are a portrayal of an int intriguing individual, often in fanciful costume. Um, and let's go back to our painting. It's a painting of a young woman who must be a real person. The model is so individualized, perhaps even more so than the model in The Girl with the Pearl Earring. By the way, both of these paintings were done around the same time in, in the 1660s. Um, both paintings are fancy paintings meant to appeal to a collector. Here we see that the woman's costume would suggest exotic, perhaps even Middle Eastern dress to contemporary Dutch viewers. See how her dress is much different than the way women were dressed in the other paintings. Her face appears luminous against the dark velvety background and has a very unusual kind of beauty. She is looking to the side, but the smile clearly responds to the viewer. And that is one of the points of this picture to not only be physically interesting, but the viewer is haunted by what kind of person this is. And again, a lot of questions about this. Who is this woman? You know, who's, wh why is she looking at us? Lots of questions. And that's, I think, what another thing that makes these paintings um, so endearing. Uh, and our last Vermeer that we're going to look at is wo Young Woman with a Lute from around 1662-63. Oil on canvas and the dimensions are 20 and a fourth inch by 18 inches. Um, so here we have a young woman glancing out of a window while she's tuning her lute. Again, remember I said that Vermeer did a lot of his paintings in the same room of the house. This is uh, looks like it's the same room as that study of the young woman that we looked at um, as, in our, as our first Vermeer painting. So here we have, she's looking out the window and she's tuning her lute. We have open song books uh, on the table um, and it indicates that she's preparing for a duet. Wealthy young people in the Dutch Republic studied music as part of their education, and amateur concerts provided a welcome opportunity for, for, for flirtation. Notice again, we have a map of Europe in the background, which reflects the decoration of Dutch homes at the time, a sign of pride in the nation's preeminence in navigation and cartography, and to show that the Dutch Republic was really a um, uh, very important uh, port city. And now we are going to move on to our last artist, and that, of course, is Rembrandt. So here we have a self-portrait of Rembrandt from 1660. Um, it's oil on canvas, and the size of it is 31 and 5 eighths inches by 26 and a half inches. So Rembrandt was actually a dedicated self-portraitist all his life. He made about 
uh, well, we have about 40 self-portraits by him that survive today. Um, his self-portraits show an intense and persistent self-examination. In this self-portrait, Rembrandt painted it when he was 54 years old. He lived to be 63. He painted this when he was 54. And we can see that the artist is unsparing in depicting the signs of aging in his own face, building up the paint in high relief to convey his furrowed uh, brow. Um, and we can also see the heavy pouches under his eyes and his double chin. Now, he was only 54 when he made this paint. He was 54 years old in this painting, which to me is quite young, especially since I, I myself am now 50 years old. Um, but he might look older because at this point in his life, he lost his beloved wife, Saskia. Uh, um, when he was only 36, he lost his beloved wife and he also had lost a child and at this point had been forced to declare bankruptcy. So I think all of those life experiences um, uh, really um, led him to have uh, um, a lot of aging. You can see a lot of wrinkles on his forehead here, a lot of worry. Notice that there's disparity between his two eyes, which gives the one eye a distracted or anxious look to it. There's more paint invested in the face than anywhere else in the painting, which, which suggests wonderful textures, especially on the tip of his nose. Also, the textures of the dense cheeks and the textures of the furrowed forehead. Remarkably, there was a large market for these kind of self-portraits that people wanted to buy them, which says a lot about Rembrandt's stature as an artist at that time. People, especially in the courts of Europe, collected paintings of princes, writers, philosophers, and they collected paintings of artists. There was a market for paintings of famous men. The thoughtfulness and directness that we see in this image is what patrons wanted from Rembrandt. So recently, there was a removal of synthetic varnish, varnish from the 1950s, which had originally been put on to protect the painting. But because it was removed, it revealed more of Rembrandt's working method. We could see more of the brush strokes. And it showed, for example, how he flipped his paintbrush to incise the end of it, the butt end, um, and make the rough curls, which are spilling out of his cap. So he actually used the other end of his paintbrush to make these curls. Okay, our next set of Rembrandt paintings, this we have on the left, the man, a man with a magnifying glass, magnifying glasses in his hand from the early 1660s. Uh, it's an oil on canvas and it's 36 inches by 29 and a fourth inches. And we have a woman with, with pink, also early 1660s and uh, about the same size, 36 and a fourth inches by 29 inches. Uh, this portrait on the left most likely depicts an Amsterdam auctioneer named Peter Haring and his wife, on the right, Elizabeth Delft. Um, the sitter may have used the magnifying glass in his hand to evaluate paintings and other luxury goods circulating on the busy Amsterdam art market um, because he was a um, art uh, auctioneer. Auctions were a key feature of Amsterdam life. It was a great port city and all works, kinds of works of art and luxury goods passed through Amsterdam. This very active art market was a source of inspiration for artists, not just because the, it gave them source material, but it compelled artists to differentiate themselves in order to make a name for themselves, to stand out against their many competitors and acquire attention among art dealers. So like his wife, uh, who's also in uh, a painting over here on view here, the sitter wears a form of fancy dress that has very little to do with Dutch clothing work, worn at the time. Both of them are not dressed in typically Dutch clothing of a time period. So in this portrait, in both of these portraits, the light dictates our gaze. Rembrandt was a master at spotlighting what he wants us to look at and letting everything else fade into the beautiful, rich, dark brown tones. Rembrandt was noted for his very rough application of paint and the way he builds it up in the faces um, with all ki different kinds of contrasting tones layered on top of each other. So same with his self-portrait where he's really layering a uh, rough application of paint um, that we saw in his self-portrait. He also doesn't have very sharp contours or edges to the faces. Instead, he's really showing the modeling effects of light on the surfaces. Rembrandt guides us to uh, appreciate key details in the painting, such as highlighting the woman's bejeweled headdress, the folds of her expensive gown, the single pink carnation in her hand, by the way, that denotes her role as a living wife, a carnation was a symbol of love and marriage. Um, and uh, her pensive expression elevates the portrait beyond, beyond a mere uh, statement of status. 
Okay. We're going to look at two more Rembrandt paintings. This one is called Hendrik Stoifels. It was painted mid 1650s, oil on canvas, and it's 30 and 7 8 inches by 27 and a eighth inch. So the woman in the painting, her name is, I'm not pronouncing it uh, the, the Dutch way, but her name is Hendrike Stoifels. She was the daughter of a soldier, and she actually worked as Rembrandt's housekeeper. Uh, and then she eventually became his common law wife and mother of his daughter, Cornelia. This, of course, was after his beloved wife, Saskia, died uh, when he was only 36 years old. Um, we don't have any formal portraits of Stoifel uh, anymore, but she is believed to have modeled for a number of Rembrandt's paintings, including this one, perhaps intended as a generic image of a courtesan. The figure's intimate gesture of holding her robe closed with one hand echoes the close observations Rembrandt made of the women in his household in many of his surviving drawings. And our last Rembrandt painting is called Aristotle with a Bust of Homer, painted in 1653. Uh, it's an oil on canvas and the dimensions are 56 and a half inches by 53 and three fourths inches. So this painting is actually among the most, uh, the Met's most celebrated works of art. And it conveys Rembrandt's meditation on the meaning of fame. So here in the painting, we have the richly clad Greek philosopher Aristotle, who lived from 384 to 322 BCE. And you can see that he's resting his hand pensively on a bust of Homer, the epic poet who had attained literary immorality, uh, I'm sorry, literary immortality with his Iliad and Odyssey centuries before. Aristotle here wears a gold medallion uh, with a portrait of his powerful pupil, um, and his pupil was Alexander the Great. Perhaps Aristotle the philosopher is weighing his own worldly success against that of Homer's uh, timeless achievement. For Aristotle, Homer represents the past and Alexander the Great represents the future, linking the generation of thinkers and rulers. Perhaps the goal that we see here represents Aristotle's material and honorific successes. But Aristotle looks quite contemplative in this painting. Perhaps he's contemplating what he amounts to compared to Homer. Will he be remembered after 500 years like he remembers Arist like he remembers Homer 500 years later? This dilemma is being played out over his face with the light and shadow. Again, typical of Rembrandt and light and shadow. The philosopher stands in darkness, but light shines on his face. The contrast of light and darkness are hallmarks of Rembrandt's work. Aristotle, you can see here, has fine white sleeves. He's wearing a more contemporary fanciful costume instead of classical garb. And his right hand rests on Homer's sculpted head. But Aristotle is not looking at the bust of Homer. He seems to focus inward. Aristotle's expression and his soulful gaze are all the more poignant because Homer was blind. Although the work has come to be considered quintessentially Dutch, it was painted for a Sicilian patron at a moment when Rembrandt's signature style, with its dark palette and almost sculptural build of a paint, was beginning to fall out of fashion in Amsterdam. Um, so I'm going to end with those. That Those are the images from the Met's collection. Um, but before we open up to questions, I did want to end with one uh, Rembrandt from the Israel Museum's collection. The Israel Museum actually does have a few Rembrandts. But this is a Rembrandt in the collection of the Israel Museum, and it's an image of Saskia, which is uh, not only um, Rembrandt's beloved wife, who I talked about, but I um, uh, actually have a cousin named Saskia, and she's named after Rembrandt's wife. Her mom was uh, was an artist. Um, and I wanted to include this specific Rembrandt because uh, my cousin Saskia, her son Akiva, is uh, they live here in Israel. Her son Akiva is a soldier in the army right now down south. And uh, uh, I wanted to include this um, and prayers for him that he should he should be safe. Um, and uh, before we end, um, I just want to take you quickly into the Met. Now, this is not the special exhibit. This is uh, what the paintings looked like when they were in the Met in the uh, galleries of Dutch paintings. Right now, they're all in a special exhibit. But the reason I just wanted to show you them, we don't have a virtual tour of the special exhibit. I just wanted you to get an idea of the size of them. Again, it's hard to see the actual paintings in the virtual tour, as I've explained before, because the technology is, is a little older. But at least you can see the size of them. Again, we've seen them close up already, but this is the uh, some of the Vermeers that we saw um, before. Um, the uh, study of a young woman we have here. And we have also the young woman with the 
uh, looking out the window and the uh, water pitcher. Uh, this is a room full of different Dutch paintings. You notice how some of them are quite small, which I had pointed out before. Um, these are some of the other paintings that we looked at. And then I also wanna get into this other room with the Dutch paintings. Uh, in this one, we have the Rem, uh, Rembrandt self-portrait. Get a little bit closer. They don't allow us to get too close, but here's a Rembrandt self-portrait. Uh, here we have two of the um, paintings, the kind of moralizing paintings they were look we were looking at the dissolute household over here. Um, uh, and the, the kind of young man and woman in the end by Franz Hall over here uh, and the dissolute household by Jan Steen over here. So again, just to give you an idea of the sizes, what they looked like when they were in the original uh, galleries uh, in the Met. And now, of course, all these paintings are together in, in a special exhibit. Um, and lastly, you can all do this on your own. So I'll just show you quickly. But as I said, I, I always like to connect my audiences and you have a number of Dutch masterpieces in your collection at the St. Louis Art Museum. As I said, you have a, a Jacob uh, Van Roysdale, this landscape with waterfall, which I don't think is on view right now. Uh, and this, uh, the little bridge. You also have, this is a great painting. This is by the artist Nicholas Moss, who I'd said was one of my favorite. He did the woman, the paint, peeling the apples and the woman with the the lace with the, the red, all the red color we talked about. So this is the one you have in, in uh, St. Louis Art Museum, the account keeper it's called. Um, and uh, you can go online and see it, but I'm pretty sure um, that this painting is currently on view um, at the St. Louis Art Museum. So you can, oh, no, it's not, it's not on view. Um, unfortunately, a lot of your Dutch masterpieces are not currently on view, but you do have a number of them. You also, as I said, you have a Franz uh, Hals painting, this one over here, Portrait of a Woman. Uh, he's the artist we looked at who did the, uh, um, we saw a number of uh, Franz Hall paintings. Those are the ones with the um, young man and woman in the inn. Uh, that was the kind of um, the couple that looked that they had been drinking. We saw that one, but you could see also did portraits and other paintings. And you have a number of Rembrandts, actually. Um, most of them, I think they were all etchings or uh, etchings and dry point. And I just looked at some of them. Um, the ones I looked at, none of them were on view. I have a feeling these aren't on view that often because they can't be exposed to too much light. Um, but you have a number of etchings and dry points that were done by Rembrandt. As you can see, I'm just showing you one page, but there are a number of pages uh, that you can find these art museum later on and see all the uh, Rembrandt etchings that are in your uh, collection. Okay, so I'm going to end my talk there and I want to leave for anyone who has time to stay uh, any questions or comments. Um, I think, Laura, did you want me to uh, um, stop screen share so we can see each other for this yeah. part? Please okay. do that, yes. So if anybody's getting, okay, Fran, that looks like you're up first. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you. I know nothing about art. I feel like now I know a little bit. <laughs> uh, okay, good. But I am a plant person. So as soon as you show that of the flowers, I start looking them up and picture this. And the amazing thing is most of those are not native to that part of the world. So that means, and peaches are not native to that part of the world. So that means they had, they were so much wealth that there was all this import. So I, I just saw so much wealth there. And then my husband and I both noticed in the one about with, where the scene with the road, all the erosion and the log, you know, washed, the, washed onto it. It was just so real. You could just really feel like you were there. Wow, thank you so much for both of those comments. So I think that's, you know, as we were thinking about the question, we started with like why these paintings are so compelling and what you just said, like they seem so real as if you can imagine being there. Uh, I think that's a great answer to that question. And thank you for pointing that out. As I said, I'm not a horticulturist, so I don't know as much about flowers, but yes, it was it was a very um, um, uh, worldly, the, the Dutch Republic at that time. And there was a lot of trade. We saw the boats in that landscape. So there was a lot of trade going on and other things that they were importing um, different flowers and, and different uh, fruits and things also. So thank you for pointing that out. So Ilana, I have a question. Okay, great. Dissolute household painting, was that a backgammon board? 
on the floor? Um, it might have been. There was definitely a game board on the floor. Yes. And and by the way, that as I had said, you know, it, it, um, the painting hinted to many um, uh, indiscretions, right? And one of them was gambling. So having that board on the floor was like hinting to that. You know, there was there was the the drinking, and there was the tobacco, and there was the the dissolute household, and then the 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 husband and the maid. So that that is a with as another symbol. Thank you for pointing out of uh, of gambling. Yes, thank you. I like how all of you are noticing so many details of the paintings and we're all, you know, learning from each other also and, and, and getting some more details that I did not point out. I also thought it was interesting when you were talking about the, um, oh, we look, had a comment, first of all, from Bill. He says, um, can you see the, the chat comment? Yes, oh. yes. Oh, great. That's Thank you for reading that. So if you want to see some of these Rembrandt works, because they're light sensitive, as I said, they're not out all the time, but you can make an appointment um, and it's free. Thank you. Hopefully next time I'm in St. Louis, maybe I could do that. I would love to see those. Thank you for telling us that. Um, and Maureen also said that you can make an appointing to see the etchings. Um, and Barbara said that she saw the, the Hall's painting yesterday as part of a tour. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. So it, it connects you know, the works from the Met to the works in St. Louis and connects me to, to, to all of you as well. That's wonderful. Do we have any other questions or comments this morning? Just checking to make sure. Well, Ilana, this was beautiful. And um, just so you know, we feel very connected to you too. And thank, uh, you. thank you for your time. And uh, we wish you all of our prayers and wishes for safe, safety and peace. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to get my mind off of it for the past hour and 15 minutes and to connect with everyone and, and share art, which is something that we can all connect over. Well, we will see you next month. And I hope that um, your family and community are, so your thoughts and prayers for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. That means a lot. Okay, you, you can see everyone's comments. They're saying it was a beautiful presentation, and it was. So thank you. Oh, yes. Let me look at the comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone. We'll get together in a month. Thank you, Alana. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.